It's bon? your turn. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. My name is Catherine Benhold. I write for the New York Times, and I will be moderating this afternoon's session on competition, cooperation, and creativity in global business. Just for disclosure, I'm by no means an expert on global business, and when I was first asked to come here today, my instinct was actually to decline. But then I thought, what would a man do in my position? You know these job applications when they have like eight criteria, and the woman says, I can't do four and I can't do six, so I won't apply. Then the guy goes, I can do three, I'll apply. <laughs> but back to competition, cooperation, and creativity. I hope the organizers won't mind me saying this is one of those conference session titles that sound very much like a conference session title. It has a beautiful alliteration, it throws around a whole lot of buzzwords, but what does it actually mean? So here's what I think it means. And here's what I think we should be talking about this afternoon, because I think it's one of the most important, the mo one of the most vexing uh, and urgent questions of our day. Basically, when we're talking about cooperation and competition, I believe we're talking in the end about how Western companies, and by extension, Western countries, can remain competitive in the 21st century. And at stake, ultimately, is not just whether we can protect our bottom line, but also whether we can maintain our way of life and whether we can protect our values, who we are, our identity. So what will our competitive advantage be with a labor force that is vastly more expensive than in emerging economies, with technologies that are radically lowering the cost to market entry and are transforming our opportunities, but also the risks we face at a speed that is hard to keep up with? With an aging population, that means our state-funded education systems are no longer really preparing the next generation as well as they ought to. And with governments, as we've heard many times already today, that are drowning in debt and have shown a spectacular failure in leadership on both sides of the Atlantic. I thought the latest poll, the Pew poll on inequality in the welfare state was really insightful. Even in Europe's so-called powerhouse, economic powerhouse Germany, you now have 64%, that's more than two, no, almost two in three adults, worrying that the next generation is going to be worse off than themselves. In France, that figure is 90%. Nine in 10 people. So when we're talking about those three Cs, we're talking in a way about nothing less than the shape of a sustainable capitalism in the future. And perhaps on another level, we're also talking a little bit about gender stereotypes. Competition and cooperation are very much gender terms. Men are supposed to be competitive, women are supposed to be cooperative, but at a time when we desperately need more, more of both, ungendering those terms might actually hold dividends of its own. So on that note, I have for you three extraordinary women who between them have broken pretty much every stereotype there is and have been extremely successful in the process. Please welcome Mouna Seperi, Executive Vice President of the Renault Group Executive Committee and Chief Architect of the Alliance with Nissan. I have Virginie Morgan, Chief Investment Officer of Eurasio, a private equity firm in France. And last but certainly not least, I have Anne Fudge for you. Anne is a board member of several blue chip companies, including GE and Novartis, and currently also a trustee at the Rockefeller Center and the Brookings Institution. I have to let you in on a secret. I'm going to start with Muna. When Muna started at Renault in 1996, she didn't even have a driving license. She couldn't care less about cars. Now she's so excited about cars that when we talked last week, she basically told me she drives four of them at different weekends when she can, and she sent me pictures afterwards of each of them just to show. They're pretty cool cars. We'll talk about those a little bit later. But Muna, firstly, I'd like to tap into your very personal experience in basically masterminding this alliance when you were hired as, as deputy counts, general counsel in Renault, at Renault. There was this idea that Renault, a regional player, very much needed a global presence. Talk about competitiveness, right? Yeah. But what were the odds that you could convince Nissan, a global player on the other side of the earth, 
to go in to an alliance with you? How did you do it? Um, well, uh, let me let me go back and do a little uh, bit of history and also to explain the uh, uh, how the auto business is working in Simple Works. Uh, it was in 1998, so 14 years ago, 15 years ago now, and uh, we had to take into account actually three three factors in the auto in the, in, in the auto industry. Um, the first one was that uh, we had uh, a few examples of failure of full mergers between uh, car manufacturers in the past. And very few examples of success, actually. Most of them failed after a few years. And this first factor actually is linked to the second one, uh, which is uh, that the uh, car manufacturers usually has a very strong uh, internal culture and with, with very uh, strong tie to the culture uh, and history of a country. Uh, Renault, this is the case of Renault in France, and as you said, by that time, Renault was a quite uh, medium-sized, generalist, uh, and European uh, car manufacturer. This is the case also for, for Nissan in Japan, but also for US car manufacturers like Ford or GM in the US, or German car manufacturers like Volkswagen. So very strong internal culture and tight linked with the home country. And the third one, as you said, we were small, and Nissan, even if they had difficulties by that time, were much bigger than we were. Mm -hmm. So we thought, okay, we want to do this cooperation, so we had to invent a new way of doing cooperation in the auto industry in, uh, in order not to face the same failures in the past, and we couldn't use the usual tool of merger and acquisitions in, in our case. So basically, because of uh, everything I've said, uh, first, we decided that we would respect each other's uh, culture and identity. So a, an alliance based on the, on, the, on, the, on the diversity and respect of cultures and identity. And also, in order to show that it was a sustainable cooperation, we would take cross-shell hoarding, but not a full merger between the, the, the two companies. So after saying that, our alliance is all about cooperation and competition, as you said. I'm trying to make the link with what mm -hmm. you have said in the, in the intro introduction. Cooperation in many fields, share first share of technology. We share technology, and because we have this cross shareholding, we give the signals to our engineers, which are usually very jealous of their know-how, that this is going to be a long-lasting alliance, and they can open the box and work together. I can give you a practical example of electric vehicle. Uh, where, where we had to invest uh, uh, around 4 billion euro for this technology. So you can imagine that for one company doing this, it's very difficult, whereas when you share it, you have a competitive advantage mm -hmm. of, the, of doing so. Then also in the field of our platforms and parts, try to have the same parts and platforms in the auto industry is very much important because it gives you the ability to, to have bigger volume and the, therefore to be more strong in front, in front of your suppliers. Also, it gave you the ability for cross-manufacturing, which means that I can manufacture Renault cars on the lines of the uh, Nissan within its production site and vice versa. And this, for example, very recently allowed us uh, to manufacture Nissan Micra. Nissan Micra were manufactured in Chennai, in India, and Nissan needed more capacity in Europe. So now they are going to manufacture their Micra uh, within a French a production site in Flan, in France. Mm -hmm. And also it allows us to enter into market uh, more easily and more rapidly. Uh, for example, Nissan benefited from the presence of uh, Renault in Russia and in Brazil, and we hope to benefit from the presence of Nissan in China in order to go more rapidly to this market. So all this is about cooperation, good cooperation in equality between the two partners. But when it comes to the front line, it, when it comes to commercial activities and marketing, then it's, it's about competition. I mean, it's fascinating. I, I, you know, what, what Muna started with, I think, is really worth remembering. There's never been anything like that done before in the car industry. Many times they tried, and it just failed each yeah. time, because they couldn't, you know, marrying basically two national champions. Difficult. I think we can learn a lot from this. Yeah. And on that point, 
your so profile. If, if you alone, yes, I'm very sure. much passionate. So as you said, now today, when you refer to the car industry, you have basically three different schemes of doing business. Right. The first one is the Toyota scheme, which is very monolithic. You have Toyota brand, Toyota bra products, Toyota culture. The second one is very much top-down, like Volkswagen. Uh, they, 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 they are a multi-brand company, uh, but basically they acquire companies, other brands, 100%, like Audi, Skoda, Seat. Very top-down, they acquire 100% and then you know, they, they sell it. And you have our scheme, which is about cooperation and competition, mm -hmm. alliance based on diversity, meaning that we never uh, do full major, we never take over 100%, mm -hmm. uh, we do cross shareholding mm -hmm. and then we cooperate in every field we can. But 14 years later, you're still going. And let me ask you, Muna, you're a woman and you are French, but you're not quite the same <laughs> as a typical French person. You have roots in Iran, you have a lot of family in America, you have an unusual profile. And so my question to you, in this very complex cultural equation, did this being different element of you help or harm? Was it, did it make it more difficult or did it actually make it easier? Uh, at the beginning, it can, it, can, it can be, I mean, you can see it in two ways. You can see it in two ways. You know, I, as you said, I was born in Iran, educated in France. I worked for a few years in the US and then in many countries around the world. So very multicultural background and also a woman, you know, um, industry in general and car industry in particular are male dominated industries. Mm -hmm. So we are doing a lot in order to change this, but historically they are male dominated uh, industries. So at the beginning, it might look difficult, you know. First of all, you can say to yourself, okay, I'm not, I, even if I feel very French or very Iranian, but you can say I'm not 100% French, I'm not 100% Iranian. So is it, a di you know, so can it be a, a problem? Or you can turn on something which may look difficult to an advantage and say, uh, okay, also because of that, I feel at ease everywhere. And I have maybe more ability to understand other cultures. And for example, for the example of Nissan, that's exactly what happened 14 years ago. I didn't know anything about Japan and the, you know, I have never been there. So when I got there, first of all, of course, it's you know, Japanese culture, also very male dominated. <laughs> So, for example, at the beginning, our Japanese friends, they were, they were addressing, you know, their mails and their queries to my team members and not directly to me. So it's like if I was not there. <laughs> but when you have the competence and expertise, I think this is very important because nobody can take it from you. And also your, uh, your cultural background will help you to understand better the others. I can give you, I can give you many examples, but maybe a very simple one is that when we were negotiating, my uh, French uh, colleagues at a certain point was telling us, these Japanese are, are not transparent, they don't say directly things, so this is a problem. And I said, well, you know, in Asia in general, but take it from Iran to, to Japan, people never say things directly. It's not a question of being transparent or not, it's a question of being polite. Mm -hmm. You never say mm -hmm. no directly. You always turn around and find a very polite way to say things. So it's not a question of transparency. It's just a question of being polite or not. So, you know, this type of thing then helps you to, to be more at ease. And quite frankly, I built a very specific relationship with Japanese, which is lasting for 14, 15 years now. I had even the occasion for a few years to have Japanese team in, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in Nissan. Um, and very close relationship, and I very much appreciate working with them. I think the fact that you can understand better several cultures mm -hmm. actually help you to integrate and to, to understand better. I think that's probably a key element of 21st century leadership, actually, if definitely. you're talking about a global yeah, world of definitely. business. Um, maybe just very briefly at the end, because there is that sort of question that lingers about why does it matter? Why should we have more women, especially in some, something that seems so male as the car industry? But then you told me last week that 60% of purchasing decisions are influenced yeah. by women, yeah, so exactly. it clearly matters. This is the magic figure. <laughs> you know, when you have a study showing you that around the world, on average, 60% of your purchases are done directly or indirectly by women. Around 30 directly by women, but not in all the countries, for example, in emerging market, notably in Brazil, uh, our purchases are 43% women. This is huge. Mm. And they influence the purchase of the family for 60%, as I said. You cannot ignore 
this number, <laughs> you know? What do women want in a car? What, what is it that, you know, what, what is it that a woman wants inside a car that maybe men don't care about so much? They like them to be nice and functional, <laughs> more <laughs> functionalities. Let's take the oh example really? that's of that's interesting. Our, yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. Let's take the example of our last uh, least small crossover, um, uh, which is called Capture. Actually, we rent a few to, to Women's Forum. Maybe you will have the occasion to see them. For, so for the first time in the history of Renault, 50% uh, of the team who made this car from design to product to marketing, uh, sales strategy are made of women. And I think this is wow. one of the reasons why this car is already a success, which make it very unique, because they took in, into consideration a woman's needs, what they want, they test. Is there a particular example you can give about something that the, the capture yeah, has? Yeah, how do you call that in English? Um, um, your... Um, boot? Uh, no, 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 the other one, your colon, your... Uh, oh, the, the, the nylon yeah, tights. Exactly, yes. sorry, tight. For example, they put something in the, in, the, in, the, in the seats of the car, which doesn't hurt your tight. Oh. Uh, don't tell me that men would have to think about about that such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you know, usually they're not selfish because the, you know, the, the seat doesn't, is, is, you know, can, it doesn't hurt your tight, but also when women have shirt and you know, when they do sports, mm. it's also the same for their feet because they have a lot of, you know. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Fabulous. Thank yeah. you so much. We'll come back to you, Muna, in a minute. And oh, but by the way, I recommend to you. She's really uh, excited yeah. about cars. <laughs> I just recommend to you, sorry, I just recommend to you to go and get your driving license because it changed my life. I don't have a driving <laughs> license. And no, I can, as I said, I can spend a day without driving. It's really fun. I have a really good bike, though. Maybe you should branch out into bike making. You know. Try the electric one. The Tweezy. Yes, Tweezy, Tweezy. See, I, I have done my homework. And you had one very early male role model, your uncle Alex, who was a business owner, and he had a roll-top desk, and you used to play there. She used to play office and boss. <laughs> this is, I think, in the 1960s. I think women were, the women who were in the labor force were mainly secretaries, but Anne was playing boss. I was. <laughs> of course, by now, she does have her own um, roll-top desk um, and became a boss a long time ago. When you were president of Maxwell House Coffee, you did a very interesting alliance yourself, and it wasn't an easy one, and it wasn't one that seemed very obvious. Um, you dealt with Starbucks, one of the most prestigious brands in the world. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'd love to, and in fact, as uh, Muna was talking about her uh, being in the car industry, I have to share this with you. I my first job out of business school was at General Mills, and I worked in cereals and a lot of other categories. And by the time I moved to General Foods, which later merged with Kraft, and was named president of Maxwell House Coffee, the funny thing was, I didn't drink coffee. <laughs> and so that was one of the first things I said to the employees when I went funny. with my cup of tea to the first meeting. And it was, it, it was really funny. One other piece before I get into the Starbucks story, I never had worked in the coffee division before, and no one had been named president of Maxwell House Coffee who had not worked in the coffee division before. So I think there is something about a woman undertaking something, apart from your little joke earlier today, that it's like, I'm going to dive in, mm -hmm. whether I've grown up in an industry or not, and I'm going to do my best, mm -hmm. and my best is going to be pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. So. As I became at, uh, president of Maxwell House Coffee in 1994, um, the out-of-home coffee was starting to grow, and we could see all the data that saying people were not making their coffee at home anymore, which had been traditional, and they were buying their coffee out of home or drinking Coca-Cola, for those of us who um, are associated with Coca-Cola. And so um, one of the very interesting things that had happened, and it was before I was name to Maxwell's Coffee was um, I met Howard Schultz. Um, he had called me, you know, in one of those friendly calls about whether or not I'd want to come and work there. And so we became friends. We kept the relationship. I obviously didn't go there. But as we started to think of ways strategically to help Maxwell House branch out into other areas, whether it was doing our own coffee stores or um, doing our own ready-to-drink products, um, I gave Howard a call and uh, obviously asked the obvious question about acquisition, which, of course, to his credit, he had no interest in, but you can't blame a girl for trying. <laughs> so um, 
a few years later, it was fascinating, we kept in touch um, because one of the, the beauties of working for a large company is that you have a research staff that understands coffee buying and purchasing and how to get the best out of a coffee bean more than any company I knew. And I offered occasionally to share it with them. I'm a big believer. I always use the word coopetition with my team, that you can cooperate and you can be competitive. And uh, when we realized that he was not going to sell it to us and we looked at other options, uh, I guess maybe six months later, we started to see that they were selling Starbucks in the supermarket out on the West Coast. And we picked that up and so it was one of those ideas, why is he gonna build a sales force when I already have a coffee sales force and we can distribute the coffee for them? So of course, mm. I call him up and I say, I see, yeah. you're, I see you're, you're testing this. Um, maybe we could partner and we could be your distributor because in many of the stores we were what they called category captains, meaning we had the knowledge of the section and could help. So fast forward, as a smart business person, Howard then said, okay, that's probably not a bad idea, but we're gonna look at some other coffee companies as well. So he then opened it up and to competition <laughs> and, and uh, Procter and & Gamble with their Folgers and, and one other and went through the process and eventually through a lot of back and forth ended up doing a deal um, where we sold their product for them and got national distribution in grocery stores. Not to say that it was as easy as it sounds because obviously there are bumps and challenges along the way when you have several people vying for that same business, but it worked strategically for both of us. And every time we'd hit a bump, I would come back to where there was commonality of benefit. And I think instead of, as you were talking about, in the ways that women lead and or approach business, we look for a win-win. Mm -hmm. It's not about butting heads, it's not about, it's, it's how do we gain the win-win, and sometimes it's not always even, but I think there are ways if you keep working at it that you can come up, and it, it ended up working well for us on the royalty side, our salespeople did a great job, and um, now there are a few hiccups along the way, so I can't go into a lot of details, but. I'm curious, I'm, you know, I, I do think the people who you are and what you represent in your cultures actually matters hugely in, in how you do these deals. And so I'd like to ask you a similar question to the one I asked Muna. You're an African-American woman. Again, both those groups are not terribly well represented at the top of business, even though slightly more diverse than it is in Europe, for sure, over there. So one thing I'm really interested in as a power woman up there, have you gotten more solidarity and cooperation from white women or from black men? Where is the solidarity stronger? So since I'm neither one, <laughs> I'm neither a white woman or a wow. black male, but let me, let me just say this. Um, you'd be surprised how I've built relationships across the spectrum. I have some incredible women friends of all nationalities and races. And I do have to share a story. I was, I was telling my husband you were gonna ask me this question and he smiled. Um, so there is, I have an incredible group of African American men who have been incredibly supportive. So much so that I call them, I, I hope this word translates, your posse. It's a group of people who protect you and are always there. They sort of have your back. And so this incredible group of African-American men, many of whose names you would know, um, had a dinner for me at the Four Seasons in New York, um, maybe about three or four months after I had been promoted to uh, run Maxwell House Coffee, just to congratulate me and to say that don't let anybody dare thinking of doing anything, you know, not good with you or by you or for you because we're here for you. And it was the most unbelievable mm. evening to have all these incredible men just come out and say, hey, congratulations, we're here for you. Fabulous. We all need male allies. <laughs> just as much as they need us. Before I segue into uh, Virginie's story, I just wanted to kind of um, 
take the opportunity because I, you did mention that you met Barack Obama and you know him a little bit. I just wanted to know the role of government is very much sort of a, an elephant in the room whenever you talk about business and competitiveness and what it can do, what governments can do to help or you know not do too much harm at least. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, in the context of this very difficult first term he's had since 2008, where basically crisis management economically and financially has been on you know the top priority, apart from a lot of you know, foreign affairs. Um, has he done a good job? Or, or let me ask you differently. What has he done that has really helped? And what has he well, done that really me, hasn't? Let me, let, me, um, let me just say a couple of things, first of all. Um, I was named to serve on the Simpson-Bowles Commission, which was looking at uh, fiscal reform within the US and a way to deal with the debt. And that was about uh, a year after he became president. Uh, that particular group, which was comprised of both senators and Congress people from both sides of the aisle, along with two business people, myself and the chairman and CEO of Honeywell, as well as um, retired White House, Alan, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles, um, senator and uh, White House chief of staff. That group worked for probably close to a year and came up with a group of recommendations which because we did not get the two-thirds votes needed, although I have to say the Senate, which seems to be the wiser body in our politic, um, the senators of both sides of the aisle did vote in support of it. One of the things, and I, I think people in general would make this um, observation, that it could have been more readily addressed or accepted um, by the White House team at that point in time, but there were other things that were going on. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, and there's still a lot of conversation around that and work happening behind the scenes, although it may not appear. As they say, things may not always be what they appear in the side view mirror as they're approaching. So I think the challenge in our country is um, driven in part by media, and what's spun and not spun. I think some of it for a democracy to really function efficiently requires an informed electorate and we now live in a world which sort of the double-edged sword of technology, um, people sort of fall into camps. Mm -hmm. Whereas before we were in a world where we read everything, whether you agreed or disagreed, mm -hmm. there was appropriate discourse. And so we've tended to sort of fall into our belief areas, mm -hmm. what supports our belief, which makes governing, I don't care whether you're president, a state governor, a senator, even more challenging, particularly in America where people just have voice in ways that they didn't have before. So if you ask me my net assessment, I think in the reality of the world that he's working in, I think he's doing a fine job, and I'm not just saying that because I know him, I can't think of a situation where if someone else was in that role that they could behave or act differently. Virginie, is President Hollande doing a fine job in the reality of things? <laughs> That's quite a direct question. Um, he's, doing, he's doing a very fine job to make sure that we have no visibility, no way of taking real proper business decision. So that at the end of the day, um, especially you know, in the sector I'm in, but not only in the sector I'm in, I think there's, um, there's a lot of um, you know, um, doing nothing up and until we have a, a better horizon, a better sense of where we're going. It's not so much the issue of um, having a very tough environment, which you know, in some shape or form we all have, haven't we? It's more a question of not knowing, you know, what's going to be the next step. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the most shocking of all, as far as I'm concerned, is when you pass a law which then applies retract uh, retroactively. Mm -hmm. That cannot happen. Mm -hmm. You know, that only happens in, you know, countries that, you know, we point to be, you know, not uh, behaving properly uh, that you find in some, you know, in Africa or some southern, mm -hmm. you know, American countries, which are pointing, we are pointing to say, you know, you, it's not pro, you know business uh, normal practices. But that's what we do mm -hmm. um, at the end. So I think fundamentally, 
and you know maybe we can illustrate this in terms of cooperation. Uh, we, you know, and it's a large we, it's the, the private equity industries, it's the business representatives, it's, um, you know, all the organizations representing business leaders, corporate companies, we've been lobbying extremely heavily. And that was nice in a way because we've shown um, amazing cooperation, you know, because when you lie against, um, you know, for getting something um, out out of the budget 214 bill, for example, or to get your voice heard, um, that's quite energetic, and that mm -hmm. you know change your uh, your 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 daily business competition. Uh, but fundamentally, that's that's quite sad. Of course, one reason governments go in that direction is because it's popular, because people need scapegoats. Scapegoats. Unemployment is going up. Everybody is bitter, and it's easy for governments sometimes to go in that direction. So let me ask you how. Your industry in particular, which is a very competitive one, um, it's also one that isn't terribly popular right now, like, let's put it that, that way, among voters. What can you do in a way to cooperate with each other and to sort of improve your reputation, not just as a marketing exercise, but in, in real ways? What, how can you be better uh, corporate citizens and you know, have some buy-in from voters that business is not all bad, particularly in a country, in a country like France, which still lives in that old, you know, old sort of world of having a fundamental antagonism between the capitalists you know, and the workers. Yeah, I think that's very true. This, this industry I'm in, which is the, um, you know, you, you call it the private equity, you call it um, professional investors, um, long term, that, that's the industry we're in. It's very competitive, um, very ma it's, it's, it's very much a male industry for sure. Um, so maybe that entails even more competition, you might say, mm. uh, in terms of behavior or type of decision making. And second, we've been through extremely rough times, haven't we? in, you know, between 2008 and 2010, both, you know, the business was extremely difficult, but also in terms of, um, you know, awareness uh, and perception and judgment, which was made as to, you know, whether this industry was responsible or not of where we finally ended up, you know, worldwide in 2010 onwards. So I think that that was certainly for me seen from you know very a re very recent perspective because I joined this industry in 2007, yet from you know investment banking, which is not so far apart. Um, but we we actually I think you were the you were the youngest partner ever named at, at Lazard Frère, no? At, at 30? Lazard, yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But then you know, in this industry, you know, you have a very heavy responsibility at the end because you're a, one of the largest investor. Uh, that's the case in France, but that's the case in a lot of countries as well. So private equity money represents 20, 25, 30 percent of the money injected in the real economy, service, business, mm. industry. It's about 20 percent of employment. So it's, it's something very serious. It's a serious contributor. And, you know, we felt that there was one area where at least we should cooperate mm. amongst ourselves in this industry. And I was trying to establish... Um, more responsible, um, uh, you know, measures in the company in which we invest, but also at our level. But you know, private e companies, private equity companies are quite small. It's small teams, which doesn't, you know, allow you to not apply to yourself some of the CSR measures. But we have much more impact in the company in which we invest. Um, so there's been in France, in Europe, in Europe, uh, a movement over the last four to five years in which um, a number of investment commitments have been made into changing the way some of the portfolio company um, do their business. So CSR. So you could say at the beginning maybe it was sort of marketing for you know some of the, um, the men in this industry. They may have felt. They may have felt that um, they needed to show some form of concern about CSR. But it actually goes beyond this because um, 
the limited partners, the ones who actually give the money to the private equity company, those guys, uh, they actually care about CSR. They CSR ask you corporate social, corporate social responsibility, which you know, cover a very large number of different areas. The first layer is, of course, governance, mm -hmm. which for me doesn't really fall into CSR because that's the very minimum that you have to do uh, in running properly a company uh, because this is, you know, remuneration committee, audit committee. So that's, I would put aside. The real topics, of course, would be women, you know, women parity or women weight into the executive committee, the boardrooms, um, uh, energy saving, environmental savings, um, change of way of doing business as well. So I think it all started maybe like everywhere, you know, as, you know, is it a marketing tool? But then it got into a more, uh, you know, a deeper conviction. And as I said, the limited partners, the one who provide the money, they actually care about what you do in terms of corporate and social responsibility measures. Give us so, some example. You mentioned Heathrow to I me. I mean, some others, examples. Yeah. I think, you know, business-wise, it's very important. In the company we have today in the portfolio, we see that on the ground, it's real business. You have to take responsibility. So I just give you some, you know, um, examples. Parking business. We have a big parking business in our portfolio. Management of parking, not very sexy, but I'll give you another one later on. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, the CO2 um, emission mm. when you run extremely big parkings like Heathrow, that's one of the parking we manage, the five terminals. When, when you answer the RFP, when you bid for the contract, you need to show that you are actually doing something real to reduce the CO2 emission mm -hmm. because the, the landlord, the owner, they want to see this. That's a very practical example. A few years before, you know, nobody really cared about those, those KPIs, really. Um, hospitality, um, you know, it, there's, there's some issues about ho so hotels. There are some issues, of course, about, you know, the amount of energy saving and water consumption, sexual tourism. Those issues are being, you know, specifically addressed by a number of groups, including Accor. Um, then you have, um, you know, many very practical topics. So mm -hmm. it's not simply a question of marketing. Mm -hmm. It goes well beyond this. You have to be deeply convinced. And then you have to make sure that you set targets. And I've, I'm sure this we will hear a lot mm -hmm. over the next three days around women, but not only around women. If you don't fix targets, if you don't incentivize the management team with, you know, quantitative, you know, money at the end or bonus, um, I think that doesn't really work. But fundamentally, that's a lot of work that we've put into, uh, i.e., you know, get the industry organized mm -hmm. behind um, corporate social responsible measures. Um, and that's, you know, one of the few items on which we collaborate. Mm. Well, <laughs> rest, you, you, pretty, need, you need better marketing. People need we're to hear about competitive. this. competitive. Yeah. Um, there's very briefly, before I open this up, um, start thinking about your questions. Um, I, I did want to just check in with you about uh, something you said earlier, yeah. um, where you're cooperating. You know, everybody talks about China and Asia and how, you know, they're, they're basically kicking our butt. Their growth is sort of three times ours and so on. But there's ways that we don't just have to be competitive with them. We can actually yeah. share in that growth. And I think you found some ways of doing that. Um, yeah, the way things are, and that's for me, very recent in terms of trends, I would say a few years only, but that's, you know, that's my experience. So it may be, may be different from some for, for others. Um, Eurasio is a pretty European um, private equity investor, and I would certainly not dare and certainly not recommend to my own, you know, my own shareholder that we start at this stage investing direct into China, because I don't have the expertise, I don't have the network, um, and that's, that's a recipe for a failure, really, mm -hmm. in, in, my, in my industry. Network and knowledge is, of course, you know, absolutely prime to make your job properly. But then what we saw, and maybe it's because we invested into a company called Montclair, which is a luxury brand in outerwear, and that brand has a very strong awareness in China, in Japan, but also in China. And that created an enormous attraction of some Chinese investors towards Eurasio because they came to us, you know, trying, you know, asking whether they might uh, co-invest with us. 
And that was a few years ago, that was two years and a half ago. And in, in the meantime, I've actually opened up a number of discussions with Chinese investors. I've actually spent the time and the energy mm. to go um, you know, to Beijing, Shanghai, more actually than Hong Kong, I have to say, a number of times over the last three years to get to know them. And then I've actually put forward to those Chinese investors some ideas of, of co-investment along our side um, in branded companies, branded luxury, branded cosmetic, uh, branded foods, and technology. Those are sort of the four very specific uh, examples I can sort of refer to today because they have, they have plenty of money, we all know that. Mm -hmm. They want to invest outside China and they are absolutely willing to bring to China brand or expertise and they're very much open to co-invest, minority co-investment, and that's going to change because tomorrow they are going to be ready to do majority deal on, on the ground because they will, have, they will have team on the ground, mm -hmm. they will have know-how and expertise. So it's, it's not going to last long, uh, but I think this is for us an opportunity to get to know them. And, you know, it's a smaller investment for us in, a co in you know, a company. So you share part of the cake today, but you make, um, you make the bet, and I deeply believe into this, that the cake will be much bigger, you know, in a few years down the road, because they will help you contribute to expanding that company specifically locally with their knowledge, their expertise, their, their network. I think that's a very good... That's pretty, yeah. pretty new, and that's a good... Cooperation. <laughs> Absolutely, and we need much more of that. I'm going to open, up, open it up in a minute. I just wanted to have the visibly slide, if I could get that up, to explain to you our very 21st century system of, of participating and crowdsourcing and all that funky stuff. So if you want to ask questions by... If I could have that slide, that would be brilliant. Oh, is it there already? Uh, Yes, I guess it is it the same thing. You can you can create an SMS and ask a question by SMS by basically texting it to the number that you see on the screen, um, the plus one nine one seven two eight four six thousand five number, and then type WF thirteen space followed by your message. You can. I'll read it out. You can tweet your contribution if you use the hashtag WF thirteen. Or you can open the browser of your smartphone and go to app, that's a -double -p dot Wissembly, oh, you've got it there, right, dot com on the, on the slide with the keyword WF13. Um, so post your message, click on the vote icon if you want to actually sort of rank questions. If you, if you don't want to ask one yourself, you can actually rank other people's questions, and I will actually ask the one within the discussion that are the most popular. So make it short, 140 uh, characters, you know the, the Twitter drill. Um, and everything is anonymous, so please be bold uh, without being rude. Um, right, let's test this. Let's test this. Who said, I'm going to test you, who said the following? No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. No shout out, we're in the 21st century, we just use technology to communicate. Let's see. I'm not quite sure how we're going to know whether this test was successful. <laughs> Roosevelt, I've got, I've got one visibly message right here. OK, so somebody has understood this. This is good news. Right. So think of your question, start texting or tweeting or even going onto, onto the mobile site via your smartphone now. I will look at them in a minute. I will ask one more question to the three, just one joint one, and then I will open it up to you. You can also raise your hand, so we'll, we'll be de democratic like that. Um, you don't want to be democratic. <laughs> I, I, I just I'm couldn't... sorry, we're networking here. Oh, you're networking. <laughs> oh, look at these people. Right. Um, I, I couldn't resist just asking one question of the three of you because these three women not only are very successful businesswomen, they also are very successful mothers. All of them have multiple children, at, at least... 
to, yes, I think this deserves a clap, a show of hands. <laughs> two boys, two boys, two girls, four children. Two boys and five grandchildren. Okay. I think this is very impressive. I have two little daughters and I, I'm struggling. Um, so, you were the first Harvard Business School first year student with two small children. She went to Harvard Business School and had a 10 month old and a four year old. Can you believe that? Anyways, um, so I, the question I wanted to ask you before I throw it open is basically, there's this big work-life balance debate going on. It's been raging ever since Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote her famous piece in The Atlantic. Um, it was out there before, but it's really heated up. I want to ask you whether you think this debate is a debate, do you, whether you think that competitiveness is compatible with a better work-life balance, whether our workplace can become more family-friendly and we can still remain competitive, or whether you think this is just a mirage and we should let it go. First of all, it's not only for women, right? It's also for men. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important for all human beings to, to, to have a nice balance between professional and, and personal life. Um, I don't think there is a magic recipe. It's a question of organization, willingness, sometimes chance. You know, I had the chance to, to be helped a lot by my uh, family and, and my, my, my husband. And I don't, I don't think it's a mirage. I, think I, I strongly think that we can do a lot. Uh, for example, you, we, talk, we talked about the place of the woman in the car industry. Uh, we, we are doing a lot in order to, to bring talent in our industry. But if we don't do anything to keep them, it's a failure. So have been, we have been we put in place a lot of measures in order for young ladies when they join us. They stay with us. For example, we, last year we opened two uh, care center in our engineering center for young mothers. And quite frankly, if I had that when I was a young mother, my, my, my mm -hmm. child is a bit younger now, it, you know, it would have been a dream. Mm -hmm. So I think really we can, it's a, it's a um, question of willingness. We can do a lot about this. We have a program at Renault for, 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 uh, for women in general, and we took this aspect into consideration. But it sounds like government has to play a role then to make it, hap make it work for companies. What do you think, And In America, that's a big gaping I hole. I don't think government is the answer. No. I think it is the, the CEO at the top to really inspire and support that behavior because I totally agree it's not just about women. It's about the men who want to be fully engaged themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, three things. I think the partner, <laughs> man or woman, is absolutely key mm -hmm. <laughs> in your balance. Mm -hmm. So if you're lucky enough and you find the right partner, I think this person can help you a great deal if 100% of the workload is not on you know, one shoulder. That's one. I think second, you know, the more you do things, the more you do things, isn't it? So I believe that you can be... Where it gets a bit tricky is where something gets wrong in your sort of organization. If, you know, a child, for example, needs more attention, then of course that creates a big problem. But then finally, on companies and culture, I think the day we stop thinking that if you're not at your desk physically, and you're not, you know, five meters across the CEO's uh, and the boss uh, office, you're actually not working, then it's going to make an extremely big difference in the working you know, balance. Uh, we have to work through objective, and we don't have to you know, just be there. Mm -hmm. So if you fix objective to your team, then they just get organized the way they want. It's trust, it's organization, it's achievement of targets. The rest doesn't count. Mm -hmm. But well, we're not yet there. I think we're definitely in phase with the audience. I just saw that on the Wissembly system, somebody posted, does private life compete or cooperate with professional life? Right, I think, um, I think it can be both in the best <laughs> of both worlds. I, I am seeing one other question here that I'm gonna pull up. Um, this is for Anne. As countries seem to be promoting an increasing protectionism in the face of crisis, 
How will that impact collaboration? That's a brilliant question and one that um, I was at dinner the other night with um, our French friends and that issue came up. I'm a believer that um, now more than ever that you have to get your own house in order. And getting your own house in order does not believe, I don't think means that you have to be isolationist. And honestly, I don't think if somebody wanted to be isolationist that they can be in today's world. We're so interconnected in so many ways. But I, I feel strongly about, it's, I, we had the conversation in our small session about trust that the first center, the center of the first step of building trust is with yourself and your core values. And I think that is so true of countries as well. I'm gonna take some old fashioned questions from the floor. <laughs> Who's old fashioned enough to raise their hand? <laughs> oh, go on. Yes, brilliant. And if I could get the second microphone, perhaps to another hand, so we speed it up, go for it. And please introduce yourself before asking your question. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Moreno. Thank you very much for your testimony. It's really beautiful. And um, my question is simple. Um, what do you think uh, about cooperation and competition between men and women? Simple, right? <laughs> Who wants to go first? Virginie. I, I mean, my own testimony, um, you know, there's, there's as much competition and collaboration between men and women than amongst men or amongst women. I will, you know, you, we may se sense from our perspective that it's harder to fight um, for good or bad reason, really. Um, but I don't think that, uh, I think this is very hard for men as well. We always tend to only, you know, speak about women in, in this forum for obvious reason. But I think it's, we are going through tough times. Uh, it's tough for men at the same age than for women. But maybe we have this feeling that um, it, it gets another sort of inch of, you know, fighting for us. But I, I would qualify it as very tough overall and no big, no big difference. We could just see from the system, this is a question that clearly has certainly two other people have voted for. People tend to think that women are more keen for cooperation versus competition. From your experience, is this a cliche? It sort of goes in the same direction. Have you had the impression? Yeah, for me, it's a bit of a cliche, and I, I tell you what I see okay. behind this. Um, I see a comment made by men about the way we manage, which sort of, what I see underneath is, you know, we're a bit weak. So we're going through co cooperation rather than, you know, fighting hard because women would be sort of qualified. Sometimes we say, you know, you, you, you want consensus. You hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. Why the hell would we want consensus and they don't? That makes no sense. That's a form, in my view, that's a form of criticism. I think sometimes we're just wiser to, you know, go around an issue to get faster to what we're looking for, which I think is brilliant, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, fighting hard, um, you know, f uh, head to head. Um, but no, I don't think, you know, women are just like this or men just like this. Uh, I think maybe women gives a bit of a, uh, more of a hand to other women because we're not that many. So you feel like a minority. So don't you help minority? Yes, you do. So you do help amongst our, uh, your, you know, your little group. You know what Madeleine so Albright said the, on this? The, the other point that you yes. talked about was compete, cooperate, uh -huh. create. Right. I do think that as women, we look for more creative solutions. Just to the point that Virginie was making, instead of just taking the direct path, we'll dig under, we'll go over, we'll go around, we look for opening the window, crashing, the, we just look for more creative solutions, I think. But so in that sense, you would say that there is perhaps a more cooperative but, urge but there. More or... it's, it's less about cooperative, it's just looking, it's, it's the mm. creative side 
I think we've talked about that intuitive side, that creative side that can just look at a problem in a different way, which leads back to the point we, that was made earlier about diversity and inclusion in an organization. Mm -hmm. There's a whole different set of questions that are asked. And I think the different set of questions and the range of questions leads to different potential solutions. I have a... Um, oh, and there, yeah, just to complete, as, as yes. Virginia said, I don't think it's a question of men or women. It's just uh, like the other question you have asked, professional or personal life, it's a question of right balance and right timing. There's a good time for competition and good time for cooperation. It's just to have the intelligence of situation to understand where, when we, you shall compete and when the cooperation is better. Here's another variation on the theme. I just caught my eye. Um, do women among themselves cooperate or compete? That's from the floor as well. Both. Yeah. Both, and yeah, there's hopefully. no particular trend in yeah, either. Hope. We have to help each other because, you know, uh, as is you there said, that solidarity? Is that real? You know, I, I have to slip in my favorite Madeleine Albright quote. <laughs> you know, she said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. I think it's very true. Um, and I just wonder whether this experience of women who become catty and don't help younger women, for example, whether that is actually a cliche that isn't true anymore and whether you find there is solidarity. Is no, that sisterhood it's real? A, it, it's a cliche. A lot of solidarity, you know. Okay. And, uh, it's but hear. it's the same for men. You have men who help others and uh, some who, who, who don't help. That's it. And so you have the same, the same with, with women. You have women who, who, who prove to be very, uh, you know, who, who are the most a lot of solidarity with, with young generation and some of them who are selfish. Is there any... Oh yeah, there's a, there's a microphone that should go there in the middle and while that's there, I'm just going to put this up on the screen. Have there been times when you have held yourself back and how did you overcome it? So think about that, but we're now going to get a question from the floor first. Should I go ahead? Okay. Um, you're all very successful women. I've looked at your profile. Uh, you see some boards, um, but it's also interesting to see that you have kids. Um, all of you have, you know, multiple children, and I think that's really exciting as well. But my question is, bringing it closer home, is do you find this competition between you and your husband at home? Interesting. Whether from you or from external, you know, external, where people are constantly comparing, and how do you manage that? Well, I, I will answer that as somebody who's been married for almost 43 years. I think the, uh, the perspective comes from outside of the home. And there have been times when people have said things to my husband that I just couldn't believe. I think I would have smacked the individual, but he is very diplomatic and answered it appropriately. But um, in terms of us, I think that it's not, um, we've always thought of ourselves as a team and maybe because we got married so young in life and you know, sort of went through the challenging times as well as where we are today. But there are times when you have different perspectives and approaches to things, but it's not necessarily a career oriented issue as much as you just have different approaches to things. Quite frankly, if, uh, I mean, as far as I am concerned, from my husband and me, the most important thing at home is our children. <laughs> so, you know, so there is no competition in raising up your children. We just do it, as, and we try to be the best parents. This is the most important, right? There is one question that I would like to wrap this up with, and then I hope that during the networking this evening we'll have plenty more opportunity, and even in during the next two, two days, really, where we will come back to individual aspects of this discussion. We can talk to the three speakers again. Um, do we have a duty to support women versus men? This goes back to this idea of affirmative action or even maybe affirmative search, but do we need to be proactive beyond the sort of talking about it and hoping for it? Do we need to actually take concrete measures to get more women leaders in place in corporations today? But let me also say part of that duty is educating men so I think we have to support men and women. And I say support men because when you as a woman support a man, it helps them understand the value that we bring as leaders. And so they move beyond the it's a woman boss or a man boss to it's a good boss. Mm. Yeah, well, definitely we have a duty. Because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Uh, we have a duty. Um, I feel, you know, I feel responsible for... 
um, you know, positive discrimination when I hire people in my team, I want women. Because I know if we don't hire women um, early, we lose some of them, of course, because we know you lose more women than men mm -hmm. because at some point they go for, you know, childbirth or they decide it's too heavy. You can't always keep them on board. So mm -hmm. if you don't do positive discrimination at the, uh, at the early stages, then you have no chance to have more women at the top. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's very important. Sometimes you have to fight for this because, you know, then men says, you know, why would we have to hire women? And, you know, and you say, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Full stop. And that's not, you know, that's not what they want to hear, but, you know, then you get into too many explanations of the why and the how, and, the, and, you know, if you have the power to decide, and why not? So that's one. Then the network is absolutely mm. key. So uh, Veronique was showing the rising talents earlier, Eurasio, myself personally, but Eurasio, we've been supporting rising talents for years, selecting the women, they're you know, amazing women, young women with their own career. This is also part of this, because you want to show you know, role model, access. It's really at the time they're 30, 35. It's a tough time, 30, 35. Mm -hmm. You're building everything at the same time. Mm -hmm private, children, business. And if you're in the corporate world, which is not the case for everybody, that's where the famous high potential are being identified. Mm -hmm. So if you're sort of, you know, schmoozing and, you know, getting lost in your per personal life because you're overwhelmed by kids, by nanny, by your husband who says, you know, I don't care, just take care of it then you lose some form of opportunity which you don't catch later. Mm -hmm. So there's, yes, we have definitely, we have a duty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Una, sure. last word goes yeah, to yeah, you. Yeah, definitely, because, you know, um, I, when I was younger, I, I didn't like the term quota and objective, etc., because I was willing to, uh, to be successful because I was working, because of my competence, etc. But experience learned to me that in some countries, we have, we have, which has a very strong... Uh, culture, male-dominated, in some areas like car industry, and at a certain level, you gave the example of board, if you don't open the door, it's going to take years and years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so quite frankly, we have to open the door, help them to get in, and then they have to prove that they are you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the right place. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be very difficult mm -hmm. and very long. Mm -hmm. Try a woman and you will love it. <laughs> exactly. And, and it's, not, uh, it's not only... <laughs> it's not only a question of gender diversity. As I said, for our business, it's also a question of being successful in business, right? So. Right. And so this is where we can close this, because ultimately, and this is the beauty of it, competitiveness actually can go hand in hand with gender, inequa gender equality very much. It does always remind me of something, you know, Madeleine Kunin, the former governor of Vermont said, she said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> I think it's as simple as that. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Well, you're... <laughs> you are an amazing panel. I think you should be running the world, basically. This is it.